Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 30, starting in verse 4. Listen to our call to worship. Sing to the Lord, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. This past month we've been singing that this is the day that the Lord has made. And the same is true for today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. And we're going to sing together in 668. Let's sing this morning. Praise God. Pray for the gospel to every home and pray for laborers. Uh, we, we are with one in, within 100 homes of uh, completing this uh, major uh, task. And so pray for laborers. We need folks that can come and help us uh, to do this. But pray for our residents. There are many people that need the Lord. And uh, just pray that they would come to know Christ. Uh, let's pray for our sister churches today. We have... I know three in our association that are seeking a pastor, and so we want to pray for them today. Pray for our Southern Baptist Convention as meetings are beginning in a few days uh, in, in California, and then let's pray for our nation. So would you join me as we pause uh, to pray today? Yes. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for time that we can pause and, and just uh, to communicate with you. We just thank you for the wonderful blessing of prayer. Lord, we, we pause to ask for mercy today. We ask, Lord, as we begin this new series on the great stories of the Bible, that as we refresh ourselves and remind ourselves of the truth that we find in these lessons and stories that we have learned as children, uh, we've often just failed to apply the principles and help us as we take a, a fresh look at these, uh, these moments. Father, we do pray for the 
Frank Glenn uh, and Trudy Adams and Brent Moffat today. Bless them and their families. Father, we pray for the majors that you'll just give great grace and, and uh, comfort to them in the passing of their loved one today. We pray, Father, for the gospel that has gone forth across our county. We pray for the lostness that exists here in Owen County. We pray for those that have, have been confronted in conversations and have been pointed to the cross. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll take uh, the word that's been shared and bring about great conviction. Lead them to a place of repentance and an awareness that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray that you'll just bless the word that's been shared. We pray for our Southern Baptist Convention. We pray for the meetings that are beginning or will begin in California. We pray for wisdom to prevail in the midst of this time and the life of our, our denomination. We pray for our leaders today. We pray that you might give wisdom to our leaders. Lord, we pray that you might grant mercy to us as a nation. Please, Lord, just guide us. Give us discernment and wisdom. And then, Father, we pray for our sister churches today, that you'll bless as they gather. We pray for their pastors today, that you'll encourage them as they preach the word. And we pray for our sister churches that are seeking a shepherd, that you'll guide them and, and lead them and help them in this time. Father, we pray now for ourselves. Help us, Lord, that we will hear you, Lord, today. Give us that ability to listen and help us to learn. Help us to be exhorted by the word and help us to make the application of your word. Bless now as we continue to worship you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand once again. We're going to sing hymn 11, All Creatures of Our God and King.
gloss over and get the relevance of each of these stories we'll be looking at. Today, as we are in the book of Genesis, we look at the great story of the Bible concerning Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. You know, someone bragged about doing their genealogical work and how far they had gone back. Man, they were just so proud. They'd gone back so many years finding out who great, 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 great granddad was. And uh, someone came along and said, Man, I've traced my genealogy all the way back to the beginning. The guy said, Man, how? He said, I found out that my great, 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 granddad was Adam. And the guy said, Okay, now I see what you're trying to do here. But folks, as we think about it, we trace ourselves back, and then we know that, after, we'll talk about this next week, after Noah and uh, the flood, uh, that we can trace ourselves back to that point. But uh, here we are face to face with this story concerning Adam and Eve. Now we're going to read uh, quite a bit together. So if you've missed reading your Bible, we're going to make up for it this morning. All right? So hang on as we look at our text. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then we'll jump to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man and said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. 
And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper that was comparable to him. And the Lord God called the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took a part of his side and closed up the flesh in its place. And the part of the side which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now the serpent, chapter 3, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tr fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it. Now, God never said that, but you see the work that's going on. Lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. So now he's questioning what God said. In verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil says God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to know the rest of the story. So the woman saw the tree was good for the food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit, and she ate. And like any good wife, she gave to her husband. And what did he do? He ate. And then the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves clothing. And then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman, <laughs> the woman, we're playing the blame game now. The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? Well, the woman decided to join the blame game too. And she said, The serpent, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. And then he said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Sorry, ladies. That's why pregnancy can be very difficult. Thank you, Mama Eve, for her decision. In pain you will bring forth children. You, your desire shall be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And then he said to Adam, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not even eat of it, curse is the ground for your sake. You that farm, <laughs> you that work, and it's hard. Thank you, Father Adam. He made it more difficult than God intended. He said, In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you'll return. And Adam then called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man had become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, here we have this great story. Adam and Eve. I know you've heard it, but this morning let's re-examine it and see if we can find some answers that I think are relevant to the day that we're living. Now right off the bat, let's see the first one. 
First thing that we notice in this story of Adam Eve and Eve is we have an answer to the miracle. Here is a miracle. People talk about miracles, but here is a real miracle. A miracle is literally taking nothing and making something. And here we see an answer to the miracle. Five things that we learn from this story about a miracle and how it happened. Number one, who created man? Who created man? And we have our children here this morning. And uh, we don't have children church for this summertime. And so they're joining us for worship. Kids, I have a question for you right now. And I want you to answer out loud, okay? You ready? Who created man? Come on, help me. Who created man? God. God, amen. Even a child knows the answer to that question. But you go to the learned. You go to the intellectual. You go to the professors and the teachers. Go out into the world and ask that question. They don't know the answer, but you kids know the answer. Who created man? God did. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. You know what's neat about the Bible? It never seeks to prove the existence of God. Never. That'd be like me standing up and saying, my sermon of the day is I'm going to prove to you that I exist. You say, you don't need to. We see you. We hear you. God didn't have to prove he exists. <laughs> you know, for one to say God doesn't exist is he is going against everything that is inside of him that says God does exist. His conscience, his mind, everything. Here we find that in answer to the miracle, you say, this is so elementary. But I want to tell you something, folks. That's not what kids are taught in school. That's not what they're taught in the universities. That's not what they're taught on, from TV and all of the, uh, the, the people in the know. But we need to remember the answer to this miracle. Who created man? God did. God made it. God said, let us make man in our image. Here we see the beautiful trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit that are all involved in the wonderful miracle of creating man. But the next question is, is when did God create man? When did God create man? Well, if you go to the science room, they'll say it was millions of years ago. Maybe even billions of years ago. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God created man on the sixth day. Verse 31 of chapter 1. Of verse 31 of chapter 1. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God made man on the sixth day. The sixth day of creation. After he had made the fish and the birds and the cattle, God made man. Now the question is, is how did God create? How did he create them? Well, man, I tell you what, this is pretty sad. But it says in chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dirt of the ground. He took a pile of dirt and breathed life into it and found there was man. There was man. Nothing really amazing about it. He just created Man from the dirt of the ground, and he brought life into him. But ladies, ladies, he went a step further for you. It tells us that as Adam was given the job of naming the cattle, the birds, that Adam realized, I don't have anybody that's compatible to me. I don't have a, anyone that, that's like me. God said, it's not good that man is alone, so he put Adam to sleep. And he went into a deep sleep and God came over there and performed the first surgery of the Bible and took a part of his side. Not as real. Used to, used to folks said man, a man has one less rib than a woman because he had to take Adam's rib to make a woman. That's not true. The Hebrew word here is he took a part of his side. And he took that flesh, he took a part of his side and then it says he made, not created, made. It's a different Hebrew word. It means he intricately embroidered her. And all God's men said, 
Amen. Y'all better, a little better than that. You that are sitting right by your wife and you gave a little puny, amen. You're going to have some answering to do when you get home. Here he made woman so intricately and special. That's how he created. God did it on the sixth day. And he did it in an amazing way. And what did he create? Kids, what did God create on the sixth day? A man and a, and a woman. A woman. A man and a woman. Did he create any other type of gender? He sure did. Man and woman. Male and female. What did he create? He created a man. He created a woman. He created a male. He created a female. Matt Walsh right now is, has, has put something out, and if you can watch it, you need to watch it, but it's a, it's a documentary about he's asking questions all over the world of people. What is a woman? <laughs> what is a woman? And I love the part where I think he's in Nairobi, Kenya, and he's talking to these African Christians, these questions about, you know, what is a woman? And he goes into other things, and, and they, there's a point where they just are just breaking out in sheer laughter that what he's proposing that people in America believe, they're, they're thinking that Americans are absolute going crazy. It's almost like, I mean, think about it. Here it wasn't too long ago, a lady stood set before Congress and they asked her a specific question. and said, ma'am, we want to ask you one question. Do you believe a man can get pregnant and have a baby? And she said, yes. Like, what planet did she come from? There is a difference between the two. A woman has the ability to have a baby. She can get pregnant. A man cannot. There's a physical difference. But here we see that God made a unique difference in the two, but he only made two, no matter what they tell us. And then the question is, the answer to the miracle of why. Why did God even do it? Why did God create man and woman? Why did he create us? And when we look back and he says, we let us make man in our image, that means that we don't look like God. Okay? That doesn't mean you look like God. I, I, there's some of these teachers that say that means that we look like God. If you want to know what God looks like, go look in the mirror. God doesn't look like me. Okay? Thank the Lord. <laughs> so what does that mean, created the image of God? It means we have the ability to think and the ability to communicate. God didn't give that ability to the animals. Your animal cannot reason. They act by instinct. But man can. Man can communicate. So God, when he made us in, in his image, he was saying, here's part of the reason why God made us that we could know him. That we could commune with him. That we could fellowship with him. The old catechism that asked the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We were created to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We can have a relationship with Him that the animals and the earth cannot have. That's why you're here. You're here to know God. You're here to fellowship with God. You're here to glorify God. An answer to the miracles. Who, when, how, what, why. There is an answer. The Bible gives us an answer. All of these things answered by the creation of Adam and Eve. An answer to the miracle. But then number two. This story gives us an answer to the myth. The myth. What are some myths that exist in our day that has had a devastating effect on society and the family? One is the myth of evolution. The myth of evolution. Most of us grew up and went to school and you were taught evolution. Not creationism, but evolution. It's a religion. You know, they say we should teach religion in the public schools, but we do. We teach the religion of evolution. It's a godless religion. Adam and Eve rebukes the idea of evolution. It rebukes it. What does it say? 
Well, it says, number one, that God created us. The evolution say, no, you were just developed from some primordial goo that finally decided it was tired of being in the water and it made its way to the land. And then it began to go through processes of evolving over millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And then, bam, here was this monkey that all of a sudden became a man. And the Bible tells us that it wasn't millions and billions. It was on the sixth day that man was made. He didn't go create a monkey and said, monkey, come on, get with it. You've got to progress. You've got to progress. You've got to progress. And bam. God didn't take evolution as his means to create man. Man was created specifically. And so here we see that the myth of evolution is debunked and rebuked by the story of Adam and Eve. Adrian Rogers said evolution is not science. It's science fiction. That's exactly right. You know, interesting thing, if you study the outline of when things were created, it's interesting that on day three, that, uh, that the birds, or, or excuse me, day five, the birds and fish were created on the same day. That just blows the evolutionary scheme all to bits. Man was created on the same day as the beast. That blows the evolution theory out of the water. You know, the creeping things were created last. And the evolutionist teaching, they were created first. <laughs> So that blows it out of the water. It blows it out of the water that man has somehow progressed when Adam was the most intelligent man besides Christ that ever walked on planet Earth. His brain was able to function at full capacity because he had no sin nature until they did sin. He was able to name the, all of the an, land animals and the birds and he remembered what he named them after he saw them the second time. Now you try that. You got to try to learn every animal that exists in the names of that and try to remember what they look like the next time you see it. Adam did. He was a very brilliant, smart man. He wasn't some caveman walking around saying, man, I just hope this evolutionary process will come on and kick in because with the next children that come along, I hope they can better from what I have been. You say, why is evolution so emphasized? Because it is clearly against the teaching of Scripture. Why is it so pushed? What is the purpose behind it? And it's amazing some of the things that, that evolutionists, I dug this out because I, I wanted to point out a thing or two, and I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. But you know, when we were sitting in our 7th, 8th, and ninth grade biology classes, we learned all these things about the evolutionary process and progress of man and how all these things have been found that prove there were these primordial uh, type of creatures that walked on the earth and then somehow they developed and let me just give you a few I find this interesting uh, about some of these that were that were found uh, back in 1924 and I'll misspell these names Astrophicathus was found by Richard Leake son of a famous evolutionist and he published that this half man half monkey uh, that they were saying was evolving Later, he finally admitted it was really just a monkey. It had long arms, sharp legs, a knuckle walker, and was just similar to an African ape. The Peking man that was found in China in the 1920s was basically built from fragments of skull, jaws, and teeth. And they somehow made him into this, this man that showed evolutionary process. The Java man was built by a large leg bone, a skull cap, and three molar teeth. Uh, put together by Dr. De DeWay, 30 years he deceived people. Right before he died, he wrote this. He testified that the place where they found these were skeletal remains of man and leg bones and teeth were found among man and the skull caps were from monkeys who in that society had hunted monkeys. They chopped the tops of their heads off as for trophies and they were in the same place. The Anderthal man who they say lived as long as 100,000 years ago, uh, now all of anthropology says he was just a hu as human as you and I. The Cro-Magnon man, who most archivists say if he was dressed in a suit today and walked our streets, would not be recognized any different than any other human being. And then the Nebraska man, who was brought up at the Scopes trial to prove evolution, was basically built from a tooth, a tooth that they found. William Jennings Bryan said evidence was, was, uh, uh, was basically short and scant scantly, and he was mocked by saying that. Well, later on, they said that the tooth 
that they suppose came from a prehistoric man millions of years earlier happened to be that of a pig. And so basically, a pig made a monkey out of an evolutionist. Then Charles Darwin, in his 1912 Piltdown Man, was built from a piece of a jaw, jaw, two molar teeth, a piece of a skull, and was claimed to be a half a million years old. Well, 40 years later, they exposed the hoax. It was the jawbone of a modern ape. ape. His teeth had been filed down, and his bones were artificially colored to deceive the public. On and on we could go. We see that evolutionary teaching is a fraud and there is a reason. Why do they, why do they promote it? Well, basically, scientists promote it not because they believe that it's due to science that backs it up. They promote it because of their sin. You see why man wants to believe in evolution? It's because they don't want to believe there is a creator God. We have a sin nature. We recognize that if God made us, we will give an account to God one day. If we believe in evolution, there is no God, and therefore we are just basically the same as an animal. We just act like brute beasts. We just live by instinct. Don't ever say that humans are another species of the animal race. We're not. We have dominion over the animals. We have dominion over the earth. If the earth can be used to our benefit, man has dominion over that. If animals can be used to our benefit, man has dominion over that. That's why we eat animals. That's why we eat animals. Now, I know we all love our pets. I told folks one Wednesday night, I said, the best job to be in today is to be a vet. Because people will spend hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars to keep that little pet going. We've become a society that has become animal crazed. We have put animals above man. God put man above animals. We need to recognize that, but we recognize that the reason they promote that is it's a denial of God, it's a denial of the sacred nature of your being as a human being, it's a denial of the Word of God, it's a promotion of immorality. It just says that man is no better than the beast and he's basically a beast and that's why a lot of kids and a lot of college students commit suicide because evolution has been grained in their mind for so long that they come to the place of realizing there's no Creator God, they have no purpose in living, I'm just evolving, and therefore I have no reason to live. But Adam and Eve remind us that evolution is a myth. And then number two. What's the second one? The age of Earth. Earth age. Adam and Eve teach us that we have a young Earth. Now what do the evolutionists teach? They teach Earth is billions of years old. You go to any science emphasis, you go to any museum, you go wander into a cave and they take you down, they talk about the millions of years that have elapsed. But the Bible tells us that man was made on what day? The sixth day. These weren't long extended days. Interesting thing in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for day is a word that can be that can mean a long extended period of time, but every time a number is connected with the word, it always refers to a 24 hour period. And not only does God make it clear it's 24 hours, he not only puts a number by the word day, but he also adds the word evening and the morning. So here we find that earth is young and not old. It takes millions and billions of years for the evolutionists to be able to push their hopes because they realize it takes that long to get man so far back that we have no way of being able to examine the evidence. So each day, 24 hours, evening and morning, and then on top of that, what did Jesus say? We're not going to go there, but in John chapter 5, verse 45 through 47, as he confronts the crowd, he basically says to them that all that Moses wrote was written by Moses. Jesus is confirming and affirming that Moses was the writer of the first five books of the Bible. He puts his stamp upon that. He speaks of Moses in a way that Moses was the writer, that he had authority. Jesus is saying, I agree with Moses. I believe what Moses wrote. Well, guess what Moses wrote in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. He said that God made all things in six days. 
So what is the reason why this, this promotion of the earth being so much older than it is? I'll tell you why. It's an attack on the very person of Christ. It seeks to say that Jesus was deceived, that the Bible has error, that Moses was wrong, and if Moses was wrong, then Jesus was deceived, and so Jesus is wrong, and therefore they bring down his authority, and they question the very word of God that it is in error. So the story of Adam and Eve answers the myth of earth being millions and millions of years old. And you may say, yeah, but how do you explain the appearance of age of things? Let me tell you something. If God can make a man from dirt and make him be mature and old, then he can create anything else he wants to to give it the appearance of age. You see, I don't believe it had to take God six days to do all that he did. He could have done it all in six seconds if he wanted to. So here we have the myth of earth, age answer. And then in closing, we have an answer to a great mystery. An answer to the mysteries. What do we learn here? As we've read much today. We've learned something about the mysteries and an answer. Number one. Number one, we learn an answer for the reason of sin. The reason of sin. Why does evil exist? Why is there wickedness in the world? Why is man so cruel and, and vengeful? Why is man like he is? In my devotional reading, I've been reading Mark and trying to read it as many times as I can as I get ready to preach through this book in a few months. But this morning as I was reading Mark again, Mark chapter 8 jumped out at me, and here's what Jesus said concerning humanity. In Mark chapter 8, in Mark chapter 8, beginning at, at verse 9, excuse me, wrong, wrong chapter. Mark chapter 7, verse 19. He says, verse 20, What comes out of a man, that is what defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. You say, what about evil? What about wickedness? What about the atrocious crimes that we've seen happen in the past week even? What about this? Why? I'll tell you why. Man is sinful. Man has a sin nature. Adam and Eve gives the answer to why man is evil, why wickedness exists. The heart of the problem, as one said, is the problem of the heart. It's the nature of the flesh. It's the nature of man. You see, Father Adam and Mother Eve did something that affected every one of us. When they chose to rebel against God, they went against His will. And they listen to the devices and temptations of the devil. And when they took of that fruit that God said, do not eat. Why did God put that there? Because they had a choice. They had a will. He was not going to make them love Him. He was not going to coerce them to love Him. He wanted them to choose to love Him. And they chose to rebel against Him. And they died. He said you will die. They surely died. They did die. They didn't die physically. They died spiritually. It was an internal work. <laughs> you know, thinking about the devil, this, this will be free and I know we're going to run over time. Isn't it interesting? What, what is this month in America right now? Anybody want to answer? What's it called? Pride Month. United States of America. We are rejoicing and lauding and applauding Homosexuality and every other immoral activity. Isn't it interesting they took the word pride to describe their month? I like what one man said. <laughs> he said, it's interesting that it was pride that turned a holy angel into the devil. It was pride that caused holy angels to become demons. And that's the word they chose to use, pride month. Turning what God created into something evil. The reason for sin and the reason evil exists is the fact 
that in that rebellion of the first Adam, it impacted all of us. We see that in the second answer to a mystery, and that is the response of sinners. The mystery of how sinners respond. How did they respond when they had sinned? Well, they were immediately aware of what? Their nakedness. You say, why, why did they get them all shook up all of a sudden? Because they were naked the whole time. You know what happened? It wasn't that they didn't see that they were naked. And some people tried to say, oh, they had a holy glow over them and, and they didn't notice that they weren't wearing clothes. That's not what it was. There was such purity of mind that as they saw each other, there wasn't thoughts of evil and wicked. It was good. It was holy. But when they sinned, they recognized the distinction of the sexes and genders. They recognized man is a man and a woman is a woman. And a woman has the ability to have a child and a man cannot. But a man is a part of that procreation process. And when they saw one another, and they, that's what came to their mind that the whole command to have children it hit them, and they realized the very things that we have rejoiced in and saw as honorable and holy, now we feel awful. Why? Because they realized that every child that would come from her womb would be impacted by their choice. They now died spiritually, and they knew that every child born was going to have a sin nature. It was going to be born with something they were not created with. They realized that the generations to come, the hundreds and thousands and millions of billions of people that would be born on planet Earth, they impacted every single one of them. And they were ashamed. And they wanted to cover those very areas that they should have seen as a blessing and should have cherished. That was their first response. An awareness, an ashamedness, and then fear when God came walking in the garden, they went and hid. We do the same thing. We sin against God. And what do we do? We forsake God. We flee from God. We quit the church. We don't want to be around Christians anymore. And so they had fear. There was guilt. There was cover-up. There was the blame game. That's how sinners respond. We never take responsibility for our actions. It's somebody else's fault. The response of sinners is the same today. And then thirdly, we see the revelation of a Savior. This is the good news. We've seen the bad news. But verse 15 of chapter 3, God gives them a merciful promise. Why didn't God just say, I'm done, you know, this, this didn't work? He could have just wiped them out. There had never been a human race. But God, who is the, such pure mercy, who reached out to them. You know, I find it interesting. You know, the Bible says that when they fell, they died spiritually. They died. They died spiritually. But they still heard God. God says, where are you? That was spiritual words. That was God speaking. Did they hear God? Yes, they heard God. They heard God. There's a teaching that says we can't hear God, that we're dead, we're blind, we're so dead we can't even hear God, that God has to, first of all, make the person alive, and then he can decide if he's going to believe. Well, that's just the opposite of the Bible. The Bible says repent and believe, and then you are revived. You get a new nature. Adam and Eve were as dead as they could be, but they heard God. They heard God speak. And God revealed to them as He speaks to them that there is the promise of a Savior. There would be a second Adam that would come. It's interesting that Jesus is called in Romans the second Adam because that's what He was. He came to make right what the first Adam did wrong. That's why the first Adam was made perfect. 
had no sin nature. He was made by God. The second Adam had to also be made without a sin nature. That's why he was born of the Virgin Mary. He did not inherit Father Adam's nature like all the rest of us did. And so God provided a Messiah, a Savior. And he gives a picture of what would happen to that one. He said, he said to the devil, he shall bruise your head. That speaks of the second coming of Jesus. He's coming again in the end times and the devil will be totally and thoroughly defeated. But he also came the first time. He said, he, you shall bruise his heel. This speaks of his crucifixion. He was saying to Adam and Eve, the one who's coming that will resolve the sin problem will be a savior who's going to come in ultimate power, who's going to come and make all things right. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to set up his own kingdom and he will reign supremely. But before he comes to do that, he's going to come and die. He's going to come and give His life. He's going to come and be the sacrifice for your sin. And God made it even clear when He went and took a lamb from the flock and killed that lamb. And that lamb's blood had to be shed. And God took the coat of that lamb and made a tunic of skin for them to put upon them. He clothed them in the, in the, in the skin of an innocent lamb who had to give His life to clothe them and he was saying to them there's coming a lamb of God who will shed his blood for your sin and the sins of all humanity and his righteousness will enwrap those who will make that choice who will say yes who will hear me speak and will hear me say come and that shows us number four the reach of salvation the reach of salvation is ultimately the mercy of God that reaches down and offers us the free gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sin. And that's why the Bible says, whosoever will may come. Today, will you? Will you come today? Will you let the old, old story of Adam and Eve that answers many of the mystery, that answers the myth, that we often face in life, will you today let the story of Adam and Eve be more than just a great story that we learn about the first created and you'll recognize the rest of the story. The story of hope, the story of salvation. If you've never been saved, if you've never yielded your life to Christ, recognize that you inherited the, a nature that will separate you from God forever and ever if you die with only that nature. And that there is hope of gaining a new nature. The nature that was lost by Adam and Eve. The nature that comes when you say, God, I'm a sinner. I admit it. I agree that Jesus, who was promised 6,000 years ago to Adam and Eve. He did come the first time, and I know He's coming the second time, but I believe He is the Savior, the Son of God, and I yield my life to the Lamb of God. I need His blood to cleanse and wash my sins away. I need His righteousness to enrapture me and wrap itself around me and make me new and make me a new person in Christ. Would you come today to be saved? Christian, how about you? So high a price that he has paid? Do you live as though it really made a difference? Do we live our lives in honor of him? Do we live for the purpose of his glory? Do we enjoy him forever? Today you might need to come and say, Oh, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I need to get serious about my faith. It's time, it's time, it's time for this altar to start being filled. Man, we want to get up and talk about the evil in the world. We recognize the evil and wickedness where it originated. But folks, they're not going to change. They don't have the power. But we do, we can change. We've gotten backslidden, we're carnal, we're, we're lethargic, we don't pray, we don't read the word, we don't share the faith. We just barely even worship much anymore. It's time for the altar to begin to be filled again. It's time for people to start pleading with God. It's time for us to be broken. It's time for us to repent of our sin.
call it sin and quit playing the blame game. It's time for us to get right with God. It's amazing how the altar has become so, so fearful, so cold. This is just our place of coming to humble ourselves and to say, Oh God, I need you. I need you. If you need to come, come. If you need someone to pray with you, come. If you need someone to guide you to be saved, come. If you have a decision you need to make public today, you just need to come and ask, confess. Just come and say, I just need the church family to pray for me. This invitation is, is for you. It's for us. As we stand, as we sing, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and obey Him and do what He's been knocking on your door to do. Come as the Holy Spirit leads.